Good morning. I really enjoyed the singing. That was tremendous. I enjoyed the special music. All those that I think are set forth to prepare our hearts before the Lord. Would you take your Bibles, please, for a moment and join with me in Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. We will not stay there very long. I will reference some verses along the way. And others, I'll ask you to look up with, uh, with me, please. But Ephesians chapter 5 is where I want to begin this morning. And as you turn there, again, I want to thank you for allowing me to come to minister to you. We've been praying for Abundant Life Baptist Church in your search for a pastor. I have the reminder, or the re- I remember the words out of Matthew chapter 9, when the, look, when the Lord looks upon the crowds, the Bible records for us there that it was moved with compassion. Think about that. And the reason why he was moved with compassion is because they were a sheep without a shepherd and scattered abroad. Uh, this church currently, I'm not talking about the leadership, but without a pastor, you as well are sheep without a shepherd. And we need to ba- bind ourselves together to pray that the Lord would lead to you that one man, that individual that would lead this church and establish, continue to establish the testimony that you have here in the city of Washington. And I pray that the Lord would allow that to happen sooner rather than later. Amen? I'm not sure. Was that a hearty amen? Amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5. Note with me, please, in a very familiar passage. I'm reading from the King James. So follow in your Bibles at verse 22. Wives... Submit yourselves unto the Lord, uh, 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 unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and gave himself for it, and the Savior of the body. Therefore, as verse 24, the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husband in everything. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present to himself a glorious church, not having a spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Verse 28, So ought men to love their wives as their own body. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. And for no man ever hateth his own flesh, but he nourisheth it and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. Verse 32, this is a great mystery, Paul writes, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. And then with verse 33, nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. May the Lord add to us the blessing that comes as we read and consider and obey his word. What we'd like to do just for a moment or so is have a word of prayer. I was directed in my Bible reading this morning to the passage in James that reminds us that we need to humble ourselves before God. And James in that passage reminds us that as we do that, God will exalt us. So in our time of prayer, would you spend just a quiet moment yourself? I'll end that moment by praying publicly. But would you ask the Lord to just humble your heart this morning? Would you ask the Lord to allow you yourself to be submissive to his word? Would you ask the Lord to do something in our service today that would bring honor and glory to him? After a moment of prayer yourself, you and the Lord, I'll close that time by publicly praying. Let's approach the throne of grace together. Let's pray. Father in heaven, though the brevity of this time together in prayer is short, We do ask that we would humble ourselves before Almighty God. 
Father, may we, as we sang already this morning, consider your holiness, your majesty. And Father, that you would allow us to have a relationship with you through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Further, that you would allow us to approach the throne of grace. Further, Father, you have given to us the living word of God. And it is that word of God that we ask would permeate our hearts and lives this morning. And Father, no doubt, when we come in contact with your word, we are confronted. And then many times, Father, we leave with a choice to be made, whether to obey or go our way and not give it a second thought. I pray that as we humble ourselves before you, I pray that we would as well allow your word to grip us, to move us, to allow your word to help us to be obedient to your will, to your way. Thank you again, Father, for this church, the testimony in this community. And Father, the heart's desire of the people gathered here in this church to have a pastor. Father, as prayed during the Sunday school hour, we continue to pray for the search committee, give them leading, discernment, direction. And even now, Father, we trust that you'll place that man that you want here to pastor these folks in a way that would bring honor and glory to you in their continued endeavor to reach this area, the city of Washington and beyond, for your name's sake. Thank you again for our time together today. In Jesus' precious name, amen. So I mentioned it's a delight to be here. I was encouraged to bring my wife because I heard that magic word, banquets. Now, I, I usually call it a family fellowship dinner, but you have elevated it. Banquets. I'm looking forward to that. So I said to my wife, would you come with me? And she reminded me that she has duty in the nursery at our church. So with her apologies, she's not able to come today. But as well, we did one of those things that you ought not to do at our age. She purchased a puppy. She has puppy duty. And uh, so if you can think about her, maybe as she gets up all the way out. Now, she has taken this on herself. It's not that I'm allowing her or said, you do that. She wants to do it. So she gets up all hours of the night. And we have a mini Australian shepherd. A dog at our age, full of energies. So you might want to pray for us, and we would delight in that. Today, as I come to you, I want to just encourage you with one thing. The message title is this, I love my church. It is my hope and desire to communicate, to remind you of your love for the local church. And I come in good standing because Peter, as he writes his second epistle, in the very first chapter of that second epistle, he says, I'm reminding you of these things, though you know them. Now, he didn't let it there. He continued. And I'm going to continue to remind you of these things while the Lord gives me life. And so we're going to talk about something this morning in our love for the local church. And you may already know these things, but I believe for you and I as believers, there's a place to be reminded of very important things of the Word of God. And I challenge you, I won't do it until I die for you, but at least I pray that we would be able to encourage one another of the importance of loving the local church. Note here in the passage, just one verse, but all throughout the church passage, Christ, or uh, Paul, as he's led by the Holy Spirit, reminds them of relationships. And here in a, a, uh, um, the context of relationships, husband and wife, he says, as Christ, husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a lofty title. That's a lofty endeavor that I need to love my wife in such a way 
to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ as he loved the church and gave himself for it. In the passage here, not only does the Lord love the, love the church, but we have many things about the Lord. Note with me, in verse 23, we have his lordship. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. His lordship, his leadership as well in verse 23. His loyalty, verse 22, as unto the Lord, we're to give ourselves as unto the Lord. Verse 24, again, the loyalty, that the church is subject unto Christ. And again, of the Lord, he is the primary lover of the church. And like that, we ought to love the Lord or the Lord's church as well. Here, love is noted in this passage by his care. Love is noted by his selflessness. He gave himself for us. His love is noted by his ongoing faithful concern. You're concerned for this church? Please understand the Lord is concerned for this church. And likewise, Paul ends this passage of that husband-wife relationship, liking it to the church, he says... This is a great mystery, but I speak of Christ and the church. Folks, dear family of God, understand Christ loved the church. And likewise, we should love the church. We need to understand that he has a special relationship to the church. He's the head of the church. He should rule the church. He leads in the church. He's the captain of the church. He's the guard of the church. He's the preserver of the church. He's the protector of the church. He's the provider of the church. And he's the lover of the church. I pray that as you understand, he saved us. He secures us. That's us, the church. And he loved us, the Bible says, think of it this way, in an everlasting love. Christ loved the church. So, as Christ loved the church, you and I ought to absolutely love the church. Understand in saying that, others have loved the church. I love the book of Philippians. And in the book of Philippians, you have at least several individuals that Paul points out that loves the church. He says in that book, of course, Christ loves the church. Paul says, I love the church, the church at Philippi. Then he reminds them to follow the example of Timothy, who loves that church. And then Epaphroditus, who loved the church so much that he sacrificially gave himself for that church. As they love the church, we ought to love the church like us as well. We ought to follow the example of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what I'd like to do this morning, if I could for just a few moments, encourage you in how you ought to love the church. I'm going to give you eight ways, and when I say anything over three ways, people fear, oh, we're going to be here all day. These are short, just little things. You may know these things. I'm here to remind you of these things, though you know them. And I pray that it would as well re-sparkle, rekindle your love for the local church. Eight reasons why we, you and I, need to love the church. Number one reason. I love the church. Because it's an assembly of believers bought by the blood of Christ. Amen? Oh boy, did you have coffee this morning? Let me try that again. Amen? It's an assembly of believers bought by the blood of Christ. Listen to this from the book of Acts. Acts chapter 20. Paul says, take heed therefore unto yourselves. He says this to the uh, the Ephesus church, take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock, that's the church, the flock, over which the Holy Ghost have made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath 
purchased with his own blood. Let me remind you, we have a common blood heritage. Long before I was able to go to the city of Pittsburgh and pastor there for 36 years, long before that, the pirates had a song. And the song was, We Are Family. Can I remind you of that very silly illustration? If you're saved today, you and I are brothers and sisters in Christ. We are family. We have a common blood heritage. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, which has purchased us. His shed blood, he's redeemed us. It's the church that is the community of the redeemed. It is the church for whom Christ died. We're the body of Christ. He's redeemed us with his precious, spotless, eternal, unblemished blood. So when I say I love the church, it is the church that is the local gathering of blood-bought Christians. You and I who know Jesus Christ, if you're saved today, we're brought into the church through his love, through his love and redeemed by his blood. So it begs the question, are you a part of the family? Now you may attend here at church, but the sad statistic is this. Even for churches like this, that the percentage might be that there might be a large percentage of those assembled here today who may not be a Christian. So are you sure you're part of the family? Are you sure that you have recognized one day in the past that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins because God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son? And have you ever by faith cried out to the Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and beg the Lord to save you by his mercy and grace. And the Bible simply puts it this way. Listen to this. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. Are you sure you're saved today? Are you sure you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Years ago, I was an associate pastor at a small church, First Baptist Church of Percocy, Pennsylvania. Percocy. And uh, I had an office in the front of the church, off to the side, with a window and so forth and so on. And every day I would see this lady who happened to go to church there. Every day I would see this lady walk by my window around the church several times. She was well into her 90s. One day Mary did not come over. And so we eventually found out that she was sick. One of the deacons went to her. This is, she's been in that church for years upon years upon years. Deacon went over to visit, and, she, and he said simply this, Mary, are you sure you know the Lord? Are you sure you're saved? And Mary Snyder responded, no, I'm not. Nobody has ever asked me that question. Today I want to ask you, are you sure You're part of the family of Christ in this church. Are you sure you've been bought by the blood? Have you ever come to that place as we prayed previously to humble ourselves? You humbled yourself before Almighty God and pleaded with him, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner. I love the church because we are family. We are bought by the blood of Christ. Secondly, I love the church because... This, I hope, is true. I love the church because it's an assembly of believers hungry for the preached word. The Bible says, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. You see, there's a principle here. Sheep must eat. 
And I believe if you're saved, you have a hunger and thirst after God and righteousness. Sheep must eat. If they don't eat, they'll be famished for a time. And inevitably, they'll die. What am I saying? I'm saying this. The people of God must hunger for the Word of God. Why? Because they know in the Word of God they'll find Christ. In the Word of God they'll hear from Him. In the Word of God they grow. Let me encourage you. Believers want to be nourished. One of the hardest things a pastor will ever hear is a a person coming into his office and saying these words. Pastor, I'm no longer being fed here. What do you mean you're not being fed here? You see, anytime the Word of God is open, there's something for you to get. You see, I can go downstairs for that banquet time, and what if I left, you know, I'm no longer being fed here. Well, that was my choice. Look at all these things here. Folks, I pray that you have a hunger for the Word of God. And I pray that as you seek for that pastor, it will be one that will willingly feed the sheep here. And together, may this church continue to grow in the grace and admonition of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number three, I love the church because the church ought to be a place where believers are earnestly fighting. No, earnestly fighting sin. Amen? A a church ought to be an assembly of believers earnestly fighting sin and zealously pursuing holiness. You see, when you're part of a local church, you're part of a family, as we just mentioned, and together we need to encourage one another to earnestly fight sin. And together we need to earnestly pursue one another to look after and follow after God to pursue holiness. For a moment, please take your Bibles and join with me in one of my favorite passages of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. This is what I'm talking about. Earnestly fighting sin, earnestly, zealously pursuing holiness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 21. And having a high priest over the house of God, the author of this book says, together, as he's writing a community of believers, he says, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure waters. He's not finished. He continues to say to that community of believers, and likewise, by extension to us, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is that is faithful that promised. Verse 24, and let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. How is that done? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the matter of some is, but exhorting one another. You and I need to continue to exhort one another to fight sin. You and I need to continue to exhort one another to pursue holiness. Exhort one another. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. One question. Is the day approaching? You betcha it is. What are we doing with one another? This ought to be a community of believers where we mutually encourage one another. Step away from sin. Where we mutually encourage one another to pursue holiness. Long time ago when I was in youth group, that was a long time ago. Give you a point of reference. My youth leader, this ought to earn me some brownie points. I'm not sure it will. My youth leader was Dave Jeremiah, David Jeremiah, that's on the radio now on TV. He was our youth leader. But you know, it's not he that was important in my life. It was a youth worker by the name of Mrs. Haynes. And Mrs. Haynes took me aside, she was a doctor's wife, took me aside when I was in youth group and said, Jeff, are you living for the Lord? 
We ought to be able to do that with one another. That changed me because Mrs. Haynes saw something in my life that was not necessarily pleasing to the Lord, and that was used to redirect my thinking, my life. That's what church ought to be. We ought to be the lettuce that we just read out of Hebrews chapter 10 and encourage one another. Where does that take place? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. So I love the church because it's a place where we mutually encourage one another to fight sin and to zealously pursue holiness. Number four, I love the church. Because the church is an assembly of believers devoted to fervent prayer and corporate prayer. One of the first things to go is prayer meeting. In my limited contact with churches, I look at their schedule, and off the calendar for the week is no prayer meeting. I, th- I think I said last time I was here, my son-in-law, who's the pastor now of the church where I'm attending, lives across the street from me. He was pastoring, an associate pastor out in California while in seminary, and the pastor said to him, Dave, we'll give you prayer meeting. And Dave, as a young seminary person, said, oh, that's tremendous. Prayer meeting was Thursday, 10 o'clock in the morning, only for senior adults. Now, it's important that they would pray. But may I encourage you, the Bible says that the church ought to be about prayer. Amen? Listen to the closing words of Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians. Paul, writing to the local church, says these words, Rejoice evermore! Next phrase he says, Pray without ceasing. That was directed to a church. Now, I understand there will be personal, individual applications of that, no doubt. But may I encourage this church, pray without ceasing. Paul continues, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. I think this way, healthy communication relationships require good communications How is your communication as a local church, corporately as you pray with the Lord? May I instead plead with you, don't take away prayer meeting. Add other occasions where you can come together to pray. As the Old Testament said, David facing Goliath. And folks, we are in a Goliath age of time here. David facing Goliath. Is there not a cause? Can I plead with you concerning prayer? Is there not a cause? I pray that this church would be a house of prayer for all men. Is there not a cause? We need to continue praying corporately. And I pray that as the Lord leads, as you will see that, you'll see his many manifold blessings. And I believe it is those blessings that come upon congregations who gather to pray. Understand this. God responds. Number five. I love the church because the church is committed to evangelism, pleading for souls. I pray that this church is committed. Oh, I forgot. Everybody in Washington, city of Washington, is probably saved anyways, right? No. Folks, you have a job to do. You have a job to do to allow this community to be taken over by the gospel. I love the church because it ought to be a community of believers committed to evangelism. Going back to my previous point in prayer, pleading for souls. It says in the book of Acts, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Later on in the book of Acts, As Paul reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, of all things the leader, Felix, trembled 
and answered, Go thy the way, for this time, for when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. You see, as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, one of the greatest ways to demonstrate our love for the Lord is reaching out to others in evangelism. I pray that the Lord would allow this church to grow that way. Once again, like prayer meeting, one of the things that we uh, allow to go by the wayside in local churches is a concern for their community. We need to be at prayer as to what the Lord would have for you in efforts to reach out into this community for his name's sake. You see, one day somebody cared for your soul. One day somebody prayed that you would come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. One day as they prayed, you understood along the way that how Jesus loved you and gave himself for you. But likewise, have you taken his love to others? What a way to demonstrate our love for the Lord by allowing others to know, for God so loved the world. Number six, I love the church because the church is an assembly of believers. Listen to this now. A church is an assembly of believers captivated by Christ and compelled to live for him. Is that a picture of your church? Take your Bibles again, please. First Thessalonians. I love this passage. I said that about Hebrews. I apologize. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. I, this is just tremendous. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. As Paul sets forth writing this book, verse 1, Paul, Silvanus, and Timotheus, and the church of the Thessalonians. So he's writing to a church which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul then writes, as he normally would as he writes those epistles, we give thanks to you, to God, always for you, making mention of you in our prayers. Now, this is why he gives thanks to God. Number one, you are able to thank God when, in verse 3, they have the right pattern of behavior. Note their pattern of behavior. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love and patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. In the sight of God and our Father, he's able to give thanks because, note, we'd be in verse uh, 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 4, they are, were on the right path. Note, we give thanks because knowing, brother, verse 4, beloved, your election of God. They were saved. They had a relationship with the Lord. He was able to give thanks, verse 2, because in 5 and 6, they were followers of the Lord. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and the Holy Ghost with much assurance, as you know what matter of men we were from among you for your sake, and how you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Ghost. You were able to give thanks in verse 2 because in verse 7 and 8, they were all the right kind. They promoted the right things. Note verse 7. They were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. What a testimony. There's something about that church. Verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of God, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith or God were to spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Verse 2, they were able to give thanks because in verse 9, they had the right priorities. They were, for they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, how you turned to God from idols to serve the tr living and true God. And finally, verse 2, we were able to give thanks. They were because in verse 10, they had the right patience. Note verse 10, and to wait for a son from heaven whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They were waiting upon the Lord. This was, as I mentioned, an assembly of believers captivated by Christ and all throughout compelled to live for him. Note, 
that church had a name in the larger community. I'm a part of a church that's called Gospel Life Church. Used to be First Baptist Church, Evan City. First Baptist Church of Evan City was known for the inward squabbling. You would go out into the community and they say, oh, you're part of that church. The current pastor, my son-in-law, and others of the leadership there no, no, noted the awful name that First Baptist had. And they changed their name. They're still a Baptist church, no doubt about it. They still hold to the same doctrines, but they changed their name to reflect a different direction in their community. No longer were those inner squabbles going to be known out into the community. Folks, that's what happens when a group of believers are captivated by Christ, 1 Thessalonians, and compelled to live for him. What about Abundant Life Baptist Church? Is this assembly here captivated by Christ? And as we leave our assembly together to, on Sundays, are you compelled to live for him every moment, every day of your life? That was the church of Thessalonia. What about this church? Number seven, please. I love the local church because the local church is an assembly of believers loving one another. Amen? Oh, wait a minute. Amen. Ought we not to love one another? Listen to this. Assembly of believers loving one another enough to serve, to reprove, and to encourage one another. I tell my wife all the time, I love you. I say, I love you, sweetheart. I'll cr climb the highest mountain for you. I love you. I love you, sweetheart. I'll swim the widest ocean for you. I love you. And her response, yeah, but will you do the dishes? <laughs> do you love one another to serve one another? Do you love one another to reprove one another? And that can be so hard to do. Do you love one another to encourage one another? I pray that we would love the church because the love of the church is to love one another as Christ loved us. You see, as believers, we receive God's love and salvation. And out of that, we ought to serve and encourage one another as Christ has done for us. Read John 13 when he takes up that towel and washes the disciples' feet. Do you love one another? Are you willing to serve one another? See, God's people ought to count it all a joyful duty and a rewarding delight to serve one another and to sacrificially love their neighbor. That's what we are here as themselves. Lastly, I love the church. Because the church is an assembly of believers supportive of their shepherd leaders. Take your Bibles again to the book of Hebrews very quickly, please. Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews chapter 13. First, an assembly of believers supportive of their shepherd, pastors, the under shepherd as he leads the flock. Note in verse 1, the author of this book says, let brotherly love continue. Note in verse 7, remember them which have rule over you who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith following, follow, considering the end of their conversation. Just a little note there because we'll see similar words in just a moment. But I believe the author is talking about those leaders that may have died. Remember how they live for the Lord. 
you might have had pastors here in this church that led you to the Lord, that discipled you or whatever. And the author is saying, remember them whose faith follow, considering the end of their lifestyle. As they taught from the pulpit here, they lived it. Remember them. And then note with me verse 17. This is a, the, the most recent, obey them which have rule over you. One day, the Lord will provide for you a shepherd leader, a pastor. Your responsibility is to remit, pray, obey them that have rule over you and submit yourselves. Why? Folks, this is the most sobering thing I see in Scripture. For they watch over for your soul. Pastor does more than preach from the pulpit here. As he goes to his prayer closet, he has every soul in this church that he's accountable to. And one day he'll stand before the Lord and give an account. Pray for that man. Pray for the one that the Lord would have come here. Again, obey them that have rule over you and submit yourself where they watch over your souls as they must give an account that they may do it with joy and not with grief for that is unprofitable for you. I love the church. The Lord has allowed me to be a part of many churches along the way. I love them. The Lord has given me an opportunity and an opportunity to be pastor for 36 years. And I want to tell you that I'm in a household where two people recently retired. I'm having a tougher time. Because every day I was thinking about the flock. I pray that you will love the church as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together in the Word. Father, this thing called the church is not a fly-by-night thing. You promised that you would build your church and the gates of hell would not prevail. And this is a local manifestation of that universal church. I thank you for the Abundant Life Baptist Church. I pray, Father, that everyone here, first, that they're saved. Well, Father, we don't want to make little of that important decision that they need to make. And I pray, Father, if there's someone here today that does not know Jesus Christ, that you would so convict them and give them no rest until by faith they trust in you. And then, Father, we pray that we would love the church. And Father, as I hear the things that Abundant Life Baptist Church is going through, my prayer is today that you would add to this company of believers those thoroughly in love with this church as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Thank you for the word today. I pray, Father, that it would be an encouragement and challenge to our hearts. In Jesus' name.